Is Alex Ross a good artist? <laughs> of course he is. I mean, just look at his work. Look at his paintings that bring these fantastical and faraway heroes up close. It's like you're really there, viewing the action, witnessing the wonder and terror of it all. He's technically skilled at his craft, and no one can deny that. Every fold in a flapping cape, every vein that courses through the bloodstreams of adrenaline-filled super gods, every strand of hair that's whisked away by the wind's breeze, all given attention to by Alex Ross's detail-oriented hand. It is this signature style that has led him to achieve a lot over the years, including making the artful opening credits of Spider-Man 2. Yeah, that was actually him. And if we're going to be hilariously brutal with ourselves, we can also acknowledge the fact that he had more artistic talent as a 12-year-old than most of us will ever have in our lifetime. Just like almost every comic book artist in the industry, Alex Ross is an exceptionally talented individual. If you clicked on this video, I think you're aware of the fact that he isn't like every other comic book artist in the industry. He finds himself in a super weird spot. He's extremely famous within the comic book community, but he's not even really a comic book artist a lot of the time. If you noticed, almost all Alex Ross art I've shown so far are from his covers. A majority of his work is just covers for superhero comics, and yet people swallow them up. I mean, of course they do. They're eye-catching, epic, and grand. Perfect for giving you a sense of excitement and curiosity, which is what superhero comic covers are designed to do. Alex Ross is truly meant to be a comic cover artist. Almost everyone from your artistic friend to your retired grandparents will come to appreciate Alex Ross's cover work. But every artist and piece of art has its fair share of detractors, and Alex Ross is no exception especially when it comes to his interior comic artwork. I have no problem if you don't enjoy his work because art is very subjective and I understand some of your guys' points. There are a few reasons for why Alex Ross's art doesn't connect with everyone. First, his coloring can be extremely bright and glaring at times. While the glossy sheen over his work can make his art feel wondrous and dreamy, it also causes others to be turned off because it's just too bright at times. Secondly, because he uses models to draw his characters, a lot of his heroes have the same face shape and body type. For a lot of people, this is great because superheroes drawn in this ideal human form makes them feel powerful, aspirational, and otherworldly. But for others, the lack of diversity in his faces and body structure comes off as really weird. Also, Alex Ross draws superheroes with costumes straight from the 60s era of comics. And while most people love that choice because it makes the heroes he draws feel timeless and classic, some feel that Alex Ross's realistic style makes these superheroes in cloth and spandex look like buff guys wearing Halloween costumes. But there's one critique of his art that is above the rest. One that almost all of us can agree on. That his art is static. I mean, of course it is. The amount of detail he puts into his artwork makes everything feel sort of still like characters posing in classical paintings. Most of the time, Alex Ross's superheroes feel like they aren't moving at all. And while this art style is perfect for covers because they capture superheroes in their most iconic, elegant, and striking forms, it becomes a bit of a problem when it comes to interior artwork. But why? Well, it's a problem because in comics, superheroes are supposed to be swinging and striking blows at a split second, powerfully leaping and launching themselves off the ground as quick as possible to save the day. 
doing rapid movements and contorting their bodies in weird ways to accomplish whatever they need to do. Alex Ross's realistic art can't show superheroes in motion all that well. It can't show the impact of a super power punch. It can't depict the speed of a takeoff or the magnitude and power of a moment. Let's compare his art to the work of Daniel Warren Johnson, a man known for his powerful action sequences. This man has taken over the industry by storm in recent years, showing off his talent in crafting emotionally powerful and resonant stories while also making incredibly insane and iconic action sequences. We just look at Vader Rebel issue 1, which is both written and drawn by him, you can see what I'm talking about. The King in Black's Beast is finally upon us. He is just beyond the gates of our beautiful home. We've planned for this day. We are prepared. And together with our might combined, we will crush this. The fist of Fin Fang Foom is unleashed upon the city's walls. The punch so quick, his hand is blurred. The impact of it so great that the bricks bend and curve. Vader Ray Bill hurls himself at the beast with all his might, his body contorting and speed lines forming around him to show just how desperate he is to kill his enemy. But all that effort leads to no avail as Fin Fang Foom grabs him like a toy and throws him down with such force and quickness that the motion resembles an orbital laser sent down from the sky. This is the type of action that Daniel Warren Johnson makes always dynamic and powerful, exaggerated and over the top, and it makes the characters in these static and unmoving pages feel alive and kicking. It's so freaking cool. And it's this kind of action that can't be reproduced by Alex Ross's artwork. Because his art is so realistic, his work can't display movement and dynamism to the degree even your standard superhero book can. But why is it? that I and many others revere the interior work that Alex Ross has done. Even though most of us can agree that Alex Ross's art lacks movement and doesn't fit most superhero books out there, why is almost every story he's actually worked on so well loved and highly regarded? Alex Ross is most well known for his art on Marvels written by Kurt Busiek and Kingdom Come written by Mark Wade. But what makes his artwork so well on both of these books is because their stories very much match the art style of Alex Ross. Even though this level of detail might not work for your standard superhero comic, it works here because of the story being told. See, what makes comic book art great isn't just whether it looks aesthetically pleasing or not, it's whether it matches the story or not. An amazing comic is created when both the story and the art come together and collaborate to create something greater than the sum of their parts. So what are the stories of Kingdom Come and Marvels that makes Alex Ross's style suit them perfectly? Well, even though their plots differ greatly from one another, both books are from the perspective of humans. The protagonist of Marvels is a photographer named Phil Sheldon, who is obsessed with superheroes, and we follow him through decades of his career as he witnesses some of Marvel's most iconic moments unravel before his very eyes. Galactus's invasion and the Fantastic Four's intervention, the mutant scare, the death of Gwen Stacy, he witnesses and records and documents this whole new era of humanity, one that has to deal with the reality of superhuman beings. A new world, both wondrous and terrifying. Kingdom Come, on the other hand, stars a pastor named Norman McKay, who through the Spectre is given the ability to witness all the events that lead up to the superhuman war. The comic takes place in an alternate DC future, one where the Justice League are old and replaced by a younger, edgier, and more immoral batch of quote-unquote superheroes. We then witness Superman and the Justice League come back from retirement to make the world right again. It's a dramatic story full of godlike beings constantly battling each other, and Alex Ross's art suits it very well in my opinion. For both Marvels and Kingdom Come, we view the world from the perspective of humans, a view from which superheroes are gods, 
overwhelmingly powerful and intimidating. We often even view these characters from below, and this perspective makes us feel weak and tiny against these godlike superheroes as they tower over us with their perfect physiques and intimidating expressions. Alex Ross is great at making superheroes feel super, and so his art is perfect for books where we view the superhero world from the perspective of weak humans. Another example of Alex Ross's art fitting the story is his Superman one-shot comic titled Peace on Earth, which was written by Paul Dini. Now, we don't view this story from a human perspective, but Alex Ross's realistic paintings are crucial for the villain this Superman tries to battle. The comic story takes place in Christmas time, and Superman tries to dedicate one day to help prevent world hunger. He travels the world delivering food to every nation, but it doesn't work out the way he expected to. Some people reject what he has to offer, other places he visits have conflict, war, and poverty to a degree he had never witnessed before. Soups even gets fired at when he tries to give the food to civilians instead of the corrupt military. In the end, he realizes that solving world hunger is impossible to accomplish alone. It's a problem that requires systematic change. It requires humanity as a collective to change for the better. The story hits so hard here not just because of the way it's written, but because of how it's illustrated. Poverty isn't a fictional villain like Fin Fang Foom. It is something real that we interact with and know about, and because Alex Ross is the one who illustrates it, it makes the story grounded in reality. And that is what makes Superman Peace on Earth so terrifying, sincere, and impactful. In conclusion, there is no such thing as a universally perfect art style for comic books. We don't need everyone to copy a certain ideal style, because there is no such thing as one. Every art style has its strengths and weaknesses, its own pros and cons. What matters is that art and storytelling work together to create the best possible comic. Jeff Lemire's art might not be suited for action-packed comics with explosions and attractive muscular characters, but it can capture sadness, tenderness, and vulnerability in ways the typical action art style will never be able to. Todd McFarlane's art style will never fit a wholesome kids comic, but only a few will ever be able to match his talent and skill in making characters look absolutely stylish and sick for edgier comics. Alex Ross might not be the quintessential interior comic book artist, but when the right story is paired with his traditional art style, it might as well be perfect. My name is Josh C, and I will see you in the next video, which will not be about comics. I hope you still stick around.